ask God in Jesus' name. God, touch him. Bless him. Heal him. In your name, we thank you, God. What an awesome God we serve. Amen. <clears throat> I said, what an awesome God we serve. Amen. He's so faithful. He's, he's, he's true. He's King of kings, Lord of lords, and, and what a privilege and an honor we have in, in, in serving him. I know that the enemy is trying. He tries everything that he can. He uses everything in his arsenal, but praise God, uh, we can do all things through Christ. Amen. We are more than conquerors through Christ. It gives us strength. This morning after first service, I was like, man, I started losing my voice. I was like, <clears throat> I better, better hold off and worship a little bit. <laughs> But uh, praise God, I know that God gives us the strength and the ability and, and His message will go forth. Amen. Um, have you ever wondered the value of influence and, and how much influence one person can have um, over so many? We think of uh, the man standing on a wall, the, the, the watchman on the wall who, who's to sound the trumpet, sound the alarm if he sees harm or danger coming. And because of his influence, he, he can save that entire city by being obedient. But the Bible also says that if he fails to blow that alarm and, and sound that alarm, um, then the blood of those people that are harmed will be upon him. And one thing we don't realize is that God has given each one of us influence but with that influence comes great responsibility that is laid upon us. And so we need to, and, and in a world today that, that, that tries to shrug off responsibility and push it on somebody else, God requires it of us as, as the people of God. And if we've ever seen a time where influence is, is such a, so, so predominant, it's in the time that we live. And we see um, in it, the, those that have such influence, the billionaires and, and those uh, social media platforms. And then you have those that are called influencers. And it doesn't mean that they're always giving a good influence, but they're influencing people around them. And we need to be careful with the influence that God has given us. We see that just a little influence can have a great impact, a huge impact upon many different people. As Christians, the Bible says that we are the salt of the earth. And we know that when we put salt on our food, just a little bit of salt goes a long way. And it can change the, fa the flavor of our food. It can take something that is bland and actually make it desirable. And so we want to, the, we want to understand the truth of being the salt of the earth and this is why Jesus says that we are the salt of the earth one thing I can't imagine this morning is um, what the world would be like without a Christian influence this is a this is a question that you and I we could not even we could not even fathom um, if the world was void of a Christian influence how different the world would be. If you have your Bibles, James, James chapter 5. And would you stand for the reading of God's Word? The value of influence. James touches on um, the influence of one person. In James chapter 5, verse 17... The Bible says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Father, we're so thankful this morning. We're so thankful, God, for um, the transformation, God, that you made in our lives, but then, Lord, you said that we are the salt of the earth. And, Lord, you have, through this, <clears throat> given us influence in the world that is around us. I pray that, God, that we would use uh, this wisdom and discernment 
God, in the way that we live and how we conduct our lives, God, knowing, Father, that we've been given a great responsibility and that, Lord, that it'll be required of us um, when we stand before you one day. Help us, God, not just to be hearers, but to truly, Father, be doers of the word and take the things that you've spoken into us, God. And may we be good stewards of what you put under us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let somebody know you're thankful that they're here this morning before you're seated. Praise God. The prophet Elijah was a servant of God, and and his character, the makeup of his character was, uh, he was a holy man. He was a holy man because of some, some, because of who he represented. And this was very uncommon in the day that he lived. You know, we look around the world today and we could say that holiness is not very common in the day that we lived, the the day that we live. But, But it was the same thing in Elijah's day. He lived under King Ahab, and, and, and Ahab was a blatant sinner. He, 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 he knew what he was doing. He knew that he was not glorifying God. Um, he was married to Jezebel. His in, in, iniquity was, was out there for everyone to see. It was infamous. And Ahab made to himself false gods, the people of Samaria, were fallen just like their monarch and followed him and followed his influence and began to worship false gods. This was felt throughout the entire kingdom and throughout all the the surrounding countries around them. And you and I could say, um, well, it's worse today, but I I would dare say that Elijah Elijah would say it it was terrible in his day. The entire kingdom had turned away from God, from serving the one true God. They had forsaken the God of Israel. They had forgotten what the scriptures had said, that the Lord thy God is one God. And they had bowed their knees in in idolatry before the heathens and the false gods of that day. To turn away from the one living God. We can't even imagine. Jeremiah says it. He says, um, have you ever seen such a thing? And God speaks to Jeremiah. Have you ever seen such a thing? He said, search from the east to the west. And he says, has any people forsaken their gods, even though they are no gods at all? He says, but my people have forsaken the living God. And I can tell you this, Christians in our day and age are doing the very same thing. The, the, the scripture of Deuteronomy chapter 28 was coming true in the kingdom of Israel during this time. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy 28, starting with verse 58, it says, If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. And this is in caps the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged plagues, and serious and prolonged sickness. You see, darkness and sickness were covering the land, even as they cover the landscape uh, today in our world. Um, Think about the the plagues, the plagues, The COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, all of these things. Could it be that a people that forgets their God faces the judgments of God? And that's exactly what they were facing because of the moral decay, the insensitivity to to God's standards. Uh, There was corrupt political power that was looming over the nation, perversion everywhere, disobedience. All of these things were normal. They had become the norm. You think about it and look around our world today. All of these things are normal in our society. The Bible says that there would come a day when evil would be called good and good would be called evil. And we're living in those times. If you're a believer and you have a moral standard, you are considered evil and judgmental and every other thing. 
But it's become a norm. And we've lived with diseases such as AIDS and all of these prolonged plagues and all of these things and sicknesses that seem to not go away. But the beautiful thing is that even in the midst of this, in Elijah's day, God did not forget his people. You see, it's, he had sent a grain of salt. He sent a, 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 a ray of light. He sent a prophet, a watchman to stand on the wall and shout a warning to spare the people from the destruction that was coming against them. Elijah had a divine influence upon history. People knew him as the prophet of the Lord. His credentials were not given by man, they were given by God. His prophecies were being fulfilled, and they knew that he was a man sent from God in a time where everything was against God. The scripture tells us, though, that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. You see, we tend to lift men like this up, men and women that held such uh, places in history, but God says he was just like you and me. The thing is, is what are we doing with the influence that God has given us? You see, Elijah gave himself to God. And we ask ourselves the the, the same question, how much influence can one person have? There's another example of a man that the Bible says he stood as a watchman in his days. In this case, the Bible calls him a voice of one crying in the wilderness, This was none other than John the Baptist, a man sent from God to proclaim the coming of the Son of God. He was there to prepare a way. The Bible says he was clothed in camel's hair. He ate locusts and wild honey. He was a spectacle to look at. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2 that he came with a message and he declared this message to all that would hear He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. A man sent from God. Many would come out there to see him. If you would see him today, you would say, well, the, the world, of course, looks at the outside, but God sees the inside. God sees the heart, the Bible tells us. We would go out and see it. If we were to go out and see him, we would probably, one of the things that we would notice probably first is maybe he didn't smell the way that everybody else smelled. Why? Because he lived in the deserts and the caves and he clothed himself with camel's hair. And again, he ate locusts. That was his diet. We would, we would think that why would God use someone like him? Well, I can tell you this. Why would God use someone like You and someone like me. His message was clear. He was a grain of salt. He was a he was a a, a beam of light in in a dark world, and he was given influence. And then we ask ourselves the question: how much influence can one person have? Matthew chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Then Jerusalem, all Judea. And all the region round about Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So one man was influencing an entire region, Jerusalem, Judea, and all of those surrounding regions around him. There was obviously something about him that attracted those that were, that were around to come out to him. See, a lot of times what we do, because we want to be influential, we try to devise ways to, to get in front of everybody. But I can tell you this, if we just give ourselves to God and take the influence that he's given us, God will send them to us. It's a powerful thing. Remember, he says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. I'll make you a spectacle. God will turn, I, I, and, and I know I don't, didn't get to say a lot of this in first service, but God, so the Bible says he turns his ministers into a flame of fire. They used to ask, Wesley, how do you draw such, such large crowds? And his response to them was, I set myself on fire and they come to watch me burn. Do you get get the idea? 
You allow God to take over everything and God will give you that influence that he gives you. He will draw all men unto himself. It's obvious that he had an influence. It's obvious that he made an impact on the people around him on the, the time that in the time that he lived in. And what amazes me that in these times, it's still the same today. They'll tell you the, the greatest advertising is word of mouth. They didn't have commercials. They didn't have billboards. They didn't have all of these things. But it was a man on fire by God. See, we should be a good influence to our family and our friends. We should be a good influence to those that are on the job. An influence to those that we come in contact with. No matter where we go or where we are, we should be a good influence. We, we will be an influence on them, but is it a good one? Matthew 5.13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. See, Jesus didn't give us uh, great explanation or go into great detail about uh, salt and what it is because uh, maybe it was just obvious the need for salt. It was obvious the importance of salt. Why? Because it was so common in their time that he didn't even feel the need to have to explain what salt was. All of us have salt sitting on our tables at home. The restaurant you go to today will have probably a, a salt shaker there on your, on your table. Um, some people use salt and they spread it on their driveways when there's ice on their driveways. Uh, it's a very common thing. But we're going to explain or go into it a little bit and explain uh, the value of being salt and the values of salt. Salt, first of all, is essential for life. What you and I may not realize is we cannot survive without salt. See, sodium is one of the key elements in salt. Salt is what the body requires in order to perform a variety of essential functions. Hear this, this is very interesting. Salt helps maintain the fluid in our blood cells and is used to transmit information in our nerves and muscles. It's also used in the uptake of certain nutrients from our small intestines. The body cannot make salt, so we're reliant on food to ensure that we get the required intake. Without salt, our body would not function properly. How important is salt? So because salt is a necessity of life, in ancient times, there was great value that was attached to salt. It was important uh, for them to use it, and it was often used in place of money. Actually, the Roman soldiers of, in the days of Christ were paid in salt. In fact, the word salary that we use for our income comes from the Latin word salarium, which is referred to as the payment the soldiers would receive with salt. This is why we, the, the, the saying comes, he's worth his salt, or he's not worth his salt. What it means, and it refers to the value of their productivity. In other words, are they worth what they're being paid. You think about it when you go to your place of work and, and they look at you and they say, uh, he's not worth his salt or she's not worth their, her salt. See, the thing is, is this, is as believers, let it never be said of us because we don't, we don't work for this world. Even though you go and you may punch a clock and you work for someone, you don't work for them. The Bible says, do everything that you do as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you do those things to the Lord Jesus Christ, you, will, you, you and I are required to give everything. Let it not be said of us believers, because this is our influence and what people are, know about Christ is, is through their experience with us. 
So if we act lazy, then they'll think that there's no reason to go to Christ. If we're, if we're always in trouble and if we're always in distress and always in despair, that's the salt, that's the influence, that's the impact we're having on the world around us. Now, I don't want you to go out of here and say, well, uh, you know, pour as much salt on your food. Pastor said salt is good for you because it's, uh, it, it can have the opposite effect on you. What it is, is it's essential for life. And in small amounts, it has a great impact. You see, a lot of times we think in our lives, well, if I don't have, I don't have a whole lot. And Mario read the, the passage of the boys' lunch that fed 5,000. And, and with women and children, it could have easily been 15,000. He just had his own lunch and God took and he multiplied it. And so whatever we have, God asks us, not for what we don't have, but the little bit that we have, God can multiply it. And so never take for granted the impact that you can make on the world around you when it's placed in the hand of God. Second, salt has medicinal per, per, prior, uh, properties. You see, many people garden with salt. And they use salt for, uh, for weeds, to get weeds out of their uh, garden. But uh, many people use it when they have a sore throat, I was in between services and I said, man, I'm, I'm starting to lose my voice. And somebody said, well, gargle with salt. <laughs> because many people gargle with salt to, for a sore throat. Your doctor may tell you to limit your salt intake because the effects it can have on your body. See, not enough salt can cause physical problems, but too much salt can also cause physical problems. Salt can have an influence in your body, for better or for worse. I don't think there's anyone here that doesn't realize the spiritual sickness that's upon our world today. All you have to do is turn on the news and you see the effects that sin is having in our world, in our nation, even in our neighborhoods. Sin is everywhere, it's rampant, and the Bible de declares to us that we are the salt of the earth, and as Christians, we're called to, br to be the medication or the medicine to help cure a sin-sick world. Think about that. God has called us to take care of the world around us. He says that you are the salt of the earth. He knew his disciples would have a great influence or an impact on the spiritual sickness that was in the world even at his time. In Matthew 9 and 12, it tells us healthy people don't need a doctor, but those who are sick do. And you know, there's a sick world, as we said, that is around us. And as the salt of the earth, you and I can help cure the sickness, the spiritual sickness that the world has fallen into. We can have an impact uh, in our world by allowing God the influence that he's given us, using it for the glory and the honor of his name. The third thing is, is salt is a preservative. For years, salt has been used to preserve meat. In a culture that doesn't have refrigeration, salt is very important. It has the ability to preserve food. You see, in ancient times, salt was rubbed into the meat before it was stored. And it helped in the, in the, in the, in the process, uh, hindering the process of decay. And so, so God is calling us, even as we see in, in fallen man, the spiritual decay, as believers, we are to go into the world because remember, we are to be in the world, not of the world. And as we're in the world, what we do is we should be rubbing off on the world. And rubbing the world with the salt that we have been given, but, but too often what happens is the world rubs off on us. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But Christians, you and I have been called to be an influence against the forces of spiritual decay that have taken hold of the world that we live in. We're the salt of the earth. James Kennedy writes this. The most dramatic impact of Christianity on the world today is that it has attached 
new value to human life. Prior to Christianity, infanticide and abandonment of children was a common practice. Hospitals as we know them began through influence of Christianity. The Red Cross was started by an evangelical Christian. Almost every of the, of the first 123 colleges and universities in the United States have Christian origins, founded by Christians for Christian purposes. The same could be said of orphanages, adoption agencies, humane treatment of the insane, and the list goes on and on of dramatic impact uh, of Christianity in our world. You know, even the, all of these uh, very, very well-known universities as Yale and, 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 and those were started by believers. They were started by Christians to have an impact on the world around them. And, and many of us, we may not start a, a university or we may not start a hospital or something like that, but you might. But we should still understand that our influence in our world because of Christ will have a huge impact on the world around us. Our behavior should reflect the fact that God has made a change in our lives. See, we've, we've talked many times that our conduct as believers matters. The way you live your life, the way you walk, the way that you, you live as a Christian, others are watching and it is having an impact on the world around us. As I said, it can have a positive impact, but can, it can also have a negative impact. And we are going to be required of it one day when we stand before God. You don't have to live like everyone else to influence people around you. As Christians, the Bible calls us to stand out from the crowd, to, to be different, to raise the standards of living. This is why many times they don't like us as believers, because we do represent a higher standard of living. 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 15 says, But as he who called you is holy... You also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now think about this. You are called to be holy. And how are you to display your holiness? Is by the way that you live. You know, one of the worst things that a Christian can say, and I've heard it many times, is, is I live in a glass house. In other words, everybody's looking in at me and, and everybody's judging me. Well, that's what you signed up for. Because the Bible says that, that, that who put, lights a lamp and hides it under a bushel? No, they put it on a lampstand. They put it on the highest place so that it can bring the most light into that darkness. And your life is there for everyone to observe. Everybody gets to look in and peer into your life. And they can say, if that's what a Christian is, I want to be a Christian. Or they might say, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want anything to do with it. And sadly enough, we've seen enough of that in our lives. The Bible calls us to have a holy influence on the world that is around us because we have been set apart. We have been preserved for holiness. We are to preserve godliness. We are to preserve purity by living in such a way that honors and pleases God because your conduct matters. If we as Christians lose the qualities of what it means to be Christ-like that makes us distinct, then we lose society and the world around us and we are not making an impact or being an influence in the way that we were called to be and we no longer have a positive impact and instead of becoming a solution to the problem we become a part of the problem it's very important for us to take up the mantle and just as Jesus said to be the salt of the earth in the old testament 
Salt was used to promote the health of a child. In Ezekiel chapter 16, there's a very interesting passage. In Ezekiel 16, in verse 4, it says, As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. See, in the Old Testament, when a child was born, it was prepared for living in this way by cutting the umbilical cord, washing this, the child in water, and then being rubbed in salt. Wesley said that salt was used to purge, dry, and strengthen the newborn child. One commentary uh, puts it this way. After the washing, the body was rubbed with salt, according to the custom very widely spread in ancient times and still met here in the, in, in the, here and there in the East, and that not merely for the purpose of making the skin drier and firmer or of cleansing it more thoroughly, but probably from a regard to the virtue of salt as a protection from putrefaction to express in a symbolic manner a hope and desire for the vigorous health of a child. You see, they looked and they saw salt as a preservative. They also saw, saw salt, salt as to have value and say they, they would place this salt upon a child symbolically to, pres to preserve that child, but also to give that child value. It's like when we take our children and we pray for them because we believe in the power of prayer. And we speak the word of God over them because we want them to, to, to represent Christ. And we want them to go out into the world and to, and to experience um, the power of God in their lives. You see, the, body, the, the Bible tells us that we are to care for the new believers. We're to care for those who have uh, recently come to place their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. As, as the church, as the body, as the family of God, we're to care for them. Um, what kind of family would leave a newborn child out in the cold and not care for it? As Christians, as believers, we're to help them. We're, help, we're to help them cut off the ties of living in sin. We're to help them clean up their act, so to say. We're to help them stay away from the infections of the spiritually polluted world that we live in. And the only way that we do this is by allowing our salt and rubbing our salt off on them. Showing them, teaching them, as the Bible teaches us, to help them to grow in holiness. Salt also, as we mentioned earlier, kills weeds. They're spiritual weeds that we need to get rid of things in our lives that need to be rooted out. There may be something in your life that keeps coming back, a sin that keeps coming up. And they would use salt and they would place salt in the, in the garden because it would kill off the weeds and it would actually help uh, reinvigorate the soil so that the plants could continue to grow. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15 in the message translation, it says, Make sure no one gets left out of God's generosity. Keep a sharp eye out for weeds of bitter disconnect. A thistle or two gone to seed can ruin a whole garden in no time. In other words, those, those things that could rise up in our lives... Bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, these are all, these all resemble weeds. And he says, if that thing comes to a place where it begins to seed and it begins to spread, it'll spread rapidly. You ever notice that in your, in your garden or even in your grass? Uh, weeds, you don't have to do anything, they just grow. And so they would use salt for this. And the Bible says that we're the salt of the earth and we shouldn't allow these things. Be careful for the weeds, a bitter disconnect. 
Be careful of those, those things that can take root into our lives. And so salt can help us root, root out all of those things and rid our lives of those unwanted things and the effect that they can have in our lives. We need to be very careful. Salt also has the power to melt ice. You want to come? If you've ever lived in an area of the country where you, where you, uh, you have snow and ice, then you're aware of the power of salt. You have a sheet of ice that, that's on the sidewalk or a driveway and some common table salt will actually help or salt rocks will help dissolve that ice. See, I believe as Christians, we're able to have that kind of an influence on the cold, hard heart that has grown bitter, that has grown hard for whatever reason. I know that the grace of God, the love and mercy of God helps us and gives us the power to change. It can take a stone of heart, as the Bible says, and turn it into a heart of flesh. In Ezekiel 36 and 26, he says, and I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. The truth is, is God has the ability to change lives. He has the ability to turn things upside down. He has the ability to take broken things heal them. He has the ability to take a heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh that will respond to him. He can take the cold part of your heart and, 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 and bring some warmth into it. And the Bible tells us that he's called us now to be the salt of the earth. And he's called us and he's allowed us to get involved in the life changing business. You and I are called to make a difference in this world. Again, Matthew tells us, you are the salt of the earth. Finally, salt promotes thirst. You see, when you eat salty foods, you want to drink more. You want to drink more water. You want to drink whatever's around. And the more salt you eat, the thirstier you become. And this is the question for those of us that are believers. Does our life make others thirsty for Christ? Think about it. Do you promote a desire and a lifestyle that others look at and say, I don't know what it is about them. But there's something about them I want what they have. It's, it's something to consider. You see, we're here to represent Christ. And, and as representatives of Christ, we either make Christ desirable or undesirable. And we're called to make him attractive, to attract people to him. That's why he said, you're the salt of the earth. You and I, our lives are to attract people to Christ. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the king of glory, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. You see, and what Christ says to you and me, he says, he says, you and I represent him in a world that is lost and that has rejected him. And what he tells us is, and I represent you at the throne before my father. You see, now God at the throne before his father, he doesn't misrepresent us in any way. He says, oh, that, that Rick right there, he says, uh, he doesn't try to misrepresent. He's, he's got some work that he needs done, but he's mine. I shed my blood for him. But he says to you and I, you represent me. In a world that has re rejected me. And don't you dare misrepresent me. 
You see, for the loose Christian that plays their life freely and thinks that, oh, no big deal, I can do whatever I want. You see, then the world has rubbed off on you and you don't realize that there's a standard and you don't realize that there is a price to be paid. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 6, verse 35, he who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But here's the truth I want to leave you with. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, the same verse that we talked about also has another effect. The salt can lose its usefulness. He says, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. This is a harsh reality. These are very firm and stern words that God gives to, to us as believers. Someone has said, whenever the church becomes a salt warehouse rather than a distri distribution center, it has lost its effectiveness. And you think of the, 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 the institutions, the universities, all of these things that were started by believers that now they don't want anything to do with God. They have lost their saltiness. They have lost their effectiveness in the world today. And God asks us, those of us that are here today, does the world look at you and see me? Are you having an, a positive effect with the influence that Christ has given you? He says, you are the salt of the earth. Would you stand? George Barna, a statistician, says that research, research shows that the average Christian in the average church is almost indistinguishable from the rest of society. The average Christian, I'm going to say that again, the average Christian in the average church is almost indistinguishable from the rest of society. Meaning, they go to the same places they go. They listen to the same things they listen to. They watch the same garbage they watch. They, they do all the same things and there is no difference between a person who says they're a Christian and an unbeliever. Why would they want to be like you? They're already like you. What the world is looking for is they're looking for something different. You see, as the salt of the earth, we're to bring hope into hopeless situations. Because our trust is not in men. Our trust is not in governments. Sure, we do our part. We, we, we go and we vote our convictions and we do those kind of things. But ultimately, whatever happens, we still look to Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter how bad it looks. We know that he's king of kings and Lord of lords. We know that he has the final say. Amen. And the Bible declares that he will return one day. And he will put all things back in order. He will do away away with the sinfulness. He will do away with the evildoers and he will establish his kingdom once and for all on earth. But while we're here representing him in this world, we are to be the hope of the world. Why? Because Christ in us is the hope of glory. When, when everybody else is running out and everybody else is hopeless, as a believer, we should say, oh, there's, there's plenty of hope. It's in Jesus Christ. It's not in what you see. You see, as a Christian, we cannot lose our saltiness. We, we, we have to use the influence that God has given us. And the world desires to have influence, but they abuse it and they use it for their own gain. But God has given us influence to help everyone around us. See, to be salt, you don't have to be spectacular. To be salt, you don't have to be sensational. All you need to be is salty. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, 
I don't know what it is about that person, but I want what they have. They're going to look at you and say, uh, how did you come through this? How did you get through that, that situation? And you're going to be able to testify, it was Christ in me. See, it's Christ that gives me the strength. He is my hope. He's my strength. He's my peace. He's everything to me. He's the one that upholds me by His, His right, strong arm. That's what the Bible says. They that humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, He will raise them up in due season. And God is going to make you strong. He's going to show the rest of the world and they're going to be hungry. They're going to be thirsty for Christ because they're going to see your good works and it's going to bring glory to the Father. Maybe you're here today and and first and foremost... Maybe you're without hope. Maybe you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This is the first thing that we want to do. You say, well, I know about Jesus Christ, but it's not about having a lot of information about somebody. It's about having a personal relationship with them. And so you can know a lot about me and you can say, oh, well, that Pastor Rick, I know all about him. And he was born in Florida and you can go on and on and on. Um, but if you, were, if you were to knock on my door and I didn't know you, I'd, I'd probably crack it open and see what you wanted first. Who are you? Um, what do you want? And you see, a lot of times we think that just because we know about Jesus, it's the same thing as knowing Jesus, and it's not. And what Jesus wants is He wants a personal relationship with Him. He loves you just like you are. Um, But Max Lucado said it best when he said, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. And he begins that transformation in your life. But to take that first step today, I want to introduce you to Jesus Christ and to a relationship with him. The Bible says we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ died and was raised again on the third day. If we believe that and we confess with our mouth, the Bible says that God is faithful and just, forgives us of all of our sins, wipes the slate clean, and you get a brand new start. And if that's you today, I want to pray with you if you're here in this building watching online. Um, This is the beginning of a lifelong walk with God. And I want you to pray with us as a church this morning. Would you pray, church? Father, forgive me because I am a sinner. Jesus, I know what you did on the cross for me. Your body was broken open and your blood was poured out for my sins. Today, I'm asking you to be my Savior my Lord, and my God. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Empower me to live my life in a way that honors and pleases the Father. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you, God, for those, Father, who have prayed. And Father, who have truly, Father, received you in in their heart, God, today. We thank you, God, for a life that will be changed forever, Father. And and God, for the work that you've begun in them. And Lord, we do believe that, Father, that even as your word says, what you have begun in them, you will complete it. And now, God, today, Father, we pray that you would prepare our hearts, God, for this next part of our service. I pray, Holy Spirit, that even as your word was spoken this morning, that, God, that you have been working on the hearts of those, God, that that are here today. And you know, Father, where we stand as believers. What I want to do in just the next few moments, church, is I want to open up this altar. And as I've said...
This altar is open for whatever need you may have. If you have something you're facing, going through, we open it up. Feel free to come. We'll have somebody pray with you. If you're sick in your body, we'll have somebody come and and pray with you. But the main altar call this morning is, um, God, maybe, maybe my salt isn't as salty as it should be. Maybe my influence hasn't been as impactful as it should be. God, I need you to help me. And I want to draw closer to you, God. And I want you to help me, Father, to be more concerned with what concerns you than what just concerns me. If that's you today, in these next few moments, I want to open up this altar. And feel free to come. And whatever need you might have, I want you just to have the freedom to come. Because here's where we're healed. Here's where we're built up. Here's where we're strengthened. And somebody's going to come and encourage you. And stand behind you and pray with you. And and, and encourage you in the faith that you can continue going. And that you can make a, a greater impact in the world that's around you. God wants to use you for great things. Will you let him this morning? Father, we thank you today. We thank you. We thank you, God, for your spirit, for your presence, God, that's in this place. We pray that, God, that as these come, Father, this morning, God, that you would meet us here in these altars, Lord. That, Lord, that you would be the one to walk up and down these altars this morning, Father, touching your people, God. I pray that, God, that even during this time, you would begin to restore us. You would begin to heal us. That, God, that you would begin to make us more effective, God. Lord, as we offer you the little bit that we have, God, that you would take the little bit and you would make it much. Father, help us, God, this morning, God, as we we draw closer to you, God. Even as your word declares, God, that as we draw closer to you, you draw nigh to us. And God, we know, Father, that the the more of you we have, God, the more that we decrease and the more that you increase in us, God, the greater influence and the greater impact we'll have in this world. God, each one of us wants our lives, Father, to make a difference. We want our lives to count. God, the greatest impact that we can have in this world, Father, is for you, Jesus. That, God, that we lead those, Father, that are without hope, that live in darkness. That, God, that we can be the light and we can be the salt. That, Father, that we can be that preserving agent. That, Lord, that we can be the ones that that make them hunger and thirst after you, O God because of what they witness in our lives. God, we're praying that you empower us to be witnesses unto you. That you would be magnified, that you would be glorified, that you would be exalted, God. Help us, God, as we surrender our lives to you, God. I pray that you would transform us for the glory and the honor of your name. You said all things pass away and all things become new, God. Help us, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. To you be all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Amen. Could we give him praise, church? He's so worthy. He's so worthy. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for for coming and and being a part uh, this morning so important that we uh, that we make an, a difference in this world and we take the the word of God the light the, we, we are the light and the salt of the earth and and you you may not realize how important the impact um, will be and how great it will be but I can tell you this um, give it to God and you'll see that it'll be beyond anything that you can think possible and don't limit God don't limit God. Just give him everything. In giving him everything, turning over everything over to him, I'm telling you, he'll he'll take the little and he'll make so much out of it. Um, we want to be we want to be what he desires us to be. Amen. We love you and God bless you. And let somebody know that you love them before you leave in Jesus' name.